Hello there guys, what is going on? Son of Chelsea back here again for another episode of the Every Other Saturday podcast. Hope you're doing well and keeping safe. I've uh, got another great Chelsea guest on, Dan McCarthy. I'm sure if you're active on Twitter, you know of Dan, uh, his work over the summer in terms of transfer news and Chelsea news in general. Uh, really grown his account, so we speak about that, but also um, life in America, you know, coaching in America. You know, he was a former player, now full-time coach, and I think that very much informs our discussion in relation to Chelsea and formation. What is Chelsea's best? formation. I felt that was a really insightful discussion and Dan made some great points. So I'm excited to share with you guys today. But also we speak of more general things, the season so far, how Frank Lampard's doing, Dan's expectations for the season under Lampard, but also transfer talk, which uh, Dan McCarthy has become accustomed to on Twitter. We speak about Declan Rice. We speak about Dennis Zakaria. Uh, we speak about Ethan Ampadu and Billy Gilmore, sort of the defensive midfield problem that we've all been speaking about recently in relation to Lampard's Chelsea. I hope you enjoy this discussion. If if you do, please give the videos a like. Also, rate and review positively if listening on the podcast. But hope you enjoy. Let's get to the conversation. So, Dan, thank you so much for coming on the channel, mate. Great to have you on. I uh, wanted to speak to you for a while based on your account growing over the summer. We'll get into that. But currently, life in America, how is it coaching in America as well? Yeah, it's great. Thanks for having me on again, buddy. Um, living in America is great. Suits me down to the ground, kind of my personality and kind of how I move. Um, California is great. You can do everything here if you can drive two hours and go snowboard you can drive 20 minutes and go to the beach so um it's really good and kind of being part of a community where we're trying to grow the game over here of football soccer as we call it here um it's fantastic and you know life's just very easy for me here in terms of what i do and doing what i love and where i live very very lucky so many people think i'm american i'm not i am english born in london but yeah living in america is great and really enjoying the coaching What's the, the culture of sort of football like? Because it has grown over time and I'm sure we could naturally link it to Christian Pulisic now in a Chelsea team. And, and I spoke to that with Alex Goldberg when I had him on the channel the other week. In terms of the growth of football, like you just mentioned there, what's in terms of being a football fan in England and sort of seeing the way we sort of digest football here compared to the way Americans do, what is the difference, at least from your perspective of that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, Americans are all about entertainment over here they're all about kind of points and goals and scores and the entertainment factor of it and also the athletic side of the game um which is the old saying right that americans are just athletes who can run fast and jump high whereas the europeans are maybe more tactical or maybe more knowledgeable of the game so that's kind of the biggest stereotypes and the biggest things we see and um, that's you know if you talk to general americans who don't watch soccer they'll say they don't watch it because it's boring and it's only you could be zero zero or one zero and they don't believe in draws and ties so that's kind of the biggest thing, but now that's kind of, they're starting to shift. The academies are now, you know, who you work with and work around are starting to shift their focus to producing talented players who are technically very good, tactically very good. And that's why the Poodle Six of this world, the Geo Rainers, obviously at Dortmund, are more celebrated now because they're a different breed of American player. And that's now starting to change. And you can really see that here in the players, even the I coach, the younger guys and even the older teams I coach, you can really see the difference now. Do you think that's going to impact the American national team positively? Because they did have a, I think it was the 2014 World Cup. They had a, quite a decent year. And, and I felt then they were sort of moving forward. But uh, what was it? I don't know if it was, was it the last World Cup they, they didn't qualify for? You know, they had difficulty right. recently. And I think Pulisic was in the team then. Um, do you think we're now going to start to see maybe the US national team grow a little bit more because of that sort of development? Yeah, definitely. I think they're going to improve. I've always said it, and many of us over here, because there is a lot of English guys over here coaching. Obviously, I'm friends with a lot of them, and we've all kind of seen the growth, and it's pretty rapid. And we've always said that the Americans have, you know, they have the facilities, they have the money, they have the size. If they put their focus into it, they could become dominant. Like, if they really kind of get the, you know, the right minds. It's the minds that they need to kind of get right, the right people who know the game. But if they do that, then, yeah, the, the squad's already improved. It's going to improve, you know. And the more kids who leave America early and go to Europe, like the Rainers and the Six again, and, you know, there's a few others, uh, obviously McKenney at Juventus and whatnot. As long as them guys keep doing that, the team's going to grow and they're going to get better and it's going to be exciting for America for sure. But not hopefully as good as England. The facilities, as you said, is just ridiculous. And you think if they get it right in terms of, as they call soccer, 
you think there could be so much talent there, there could be so much development, so much investment, but America is such a big country and there's so many other sports uh, sort of fighting for relevance there as well. But the other thing I want to talk to you about, and we'll get back to sort of your coaching background in relation to Chelsea, because I think that's an interesting discussion to have. Um, your growth over the summer in terms of your Twitter account has been amazing, really, in terms of the transfer window. And I think for a lot of us, the, the Chelsea transfer window did a lot of good for sort of the online community uh, based on the excitement. Um sort of reporting on Chelsea news and and having that insight and information is that something you've always wanted to do in terms of reporting on Chelsea it's a good question Uh, probably not I'll be honest probably not Um, you know journalist has never been like my ultimate goal and I don't consider myself a journalist so when people call me or an ITK I'm like no 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 just a a lucky guy who's connected to some people in the club about the club Um, so never been like a dream or something it was never really a goal of mine I joined Twitter a long time ago, maybe as many people did in the normal world of Twitter. And I didn't even know what Twitter was. And then a couple of years ago, kind of just found my way, like many of us do, I guess, find my way in it, kind of connected with some good people. Um, and then I obviously did a Chelsea Echo a few years ago with Simon back in the good old days. And, you know, me and Simon grew up a good relationship and he was obviously very connected. Um, and I always had the same connections I've always had now, kind of from when I played and who I know around the club and whatever. But I never kind of shared the information. Uh, I just never put it on my Twitter. I kind of just kept it to myself or shared it with people who I knew and respected. Uh, and then Simon was always kind of in the ear saying, Dan, you should make something of this. You should use this. And I was like, I was kind of just giving him stuff for the Echo. And then I took a break for a while, for a few months. I kind of came off football Twitter because I got busy with coaching. And then when I came back, Simon, we reconnected again. And he kind of said, like, maybe it'll be a good thing to kind of get your account going again. And you should try it and see how it goes. I was like... And as you've said, there, it's been a massive change and people don't realise how big a change it is. It's kind of, you kind of miss sometimes just coming on and not having a million questions and DMs, but it's been great. The growth's been great. Um, as you can see from kind of the way I handle my account, I don't, I'm not, it's not like big headed or big time. I don't do like, oh, thanks for 20,000 followers. Like, it's just not my thing. I'm not really doing it for followers. I mean, it's great. I love the followers. I love the interaction. I've built some really good relationships now with journalists with connected people like yourself so i'm very happy for that but yeah the growth's been pretty crazy and you know it's different for sure but again it's fun and i enjoy it Mm. is there because i'm sure like everyone gets criticism about things they do and especially in the world of transfers and it's it's an obvious and cliche term now in terms of football twitter but itk you know that's the instant thing that's thrown out when you don't have a verified tick on your twitter account you don't work for one of the mainstream publications and you claim to have information uh, it's instantly thrown at you of itk and i think that's a, a very relevant thing because even now you can find those people right they're very easy to find i mean how was striking that balance and sort of making clear that you're not just throwing stuff out there for the sake of it and, and trying to make a name for yourself when you actually do have legit info has that been fu- frustrating for you because even if you try and put the best info out there there's always going to be those people who doubt you have relevant information yeah no it's, it's definitely hard um i think i've done i'd like to say i've done a good job of it in terms of kind of staying down to earth and kind of grounded i am obviously a little bit older than some of the people on that not that old by the way i've had a few 30 or 40 year old shouts it's not that old um but because maybe being older and more experienced and i've been in the game for a long time like you know i played it obviously pro back home and then coached a long time i kind of get that in terms of football twitter yeah, the balance is definitely hard. Um, but luckily with the transfer window, hence the growth, I was pretty accurate with it and I wasn't just throwing things out there for the sake of it. Um, you know, you do get a lot more information than you share. I think everybody who's connected will tell you that. We do know a lot more than, especially the journalists in this world, the Matt Laws and them guys. They know more than they let on and rightfully so. So, you know, it's kind of picking and choosing what to share, what not to. And, you know, you're going to get some wrong. Even the they call him the GOAT, right? Fabrizio Romano, like he's the GOAT and he gets things, everyone gets things wrong. Um, it's transfers, it's team news, it changes. But yeah, the balance has been tough, but maybe because I'm a little bit older and a bit more grounded, it's been kind of easy to um, to balance it. And I always kind of used to say back in the day, I never blocked anybody or muted anybody. Since this account change, I've definitely had to do that a couple of times just because, you know, people get excited and it's easy to kind of hide behind an AV and do that. But for the most part, it's been very positive and great, to be honest. 
I think sort of the balance that you you can have there, and also the honesty. If you get something wrong, I mean, I, I think that the, the problem nowadays with a lot of things, if you get something wrong, you'll see people sort of hide away from it or deny it ever happened or double down. I think you know the honesty of you. If you get something wrong, you're very quick to say so and say, you know, I was wrong on this one, but you know, we move on. And I think that will give you credibility to people who follow your account. You know, not, you're not just going out there and rejecting any information that disputes what you say. I've seen many accounts try and claim they've got transfer news. It doesn't come to fruition, but they don't say anything about it or they start having a go at people. I think you you act in sort of the right way, to, I think, to give you give you credibility. In relation to Chelsea, and, um, you know, this very much connects to the amazing transfer window, the start of the season. Um, I don't know if it's harsh to say, like, a mediocre start to the season. I feel that's harsh because it has been a very frantic and unique start to any Premier League season I think we've ever seen and all teams are struggling with different issues. Um, what has surprised you most about Frank Lampard's team so far this season? Because there were big expectations going into it. What's well, a good question. That surprised me the most would probably be, um, I would say how many goals we've conceded. I knew we'd concede goals. Um, I didn't realise maybe how many we concede. I'd say that's the biggest surprise. I'm not surprised by many things that people are surprised about. I'm not surprised it's taken a while for the attacking players to get settled down. I'm not surprised we've changed formation three, four times. I kind of knew that Lampard would do that. Um, so maybe not the obvious things. Um, I, I maybe you can say that conceding goals is obvious, but the amount we've conceded, you know, six in to West Brom and Southampton is a bit mental. To be honest, so that's been my biggest surprise. But in terms of the other stuff that people were surprised about, maybe not as much because it is a new team and so many signings and it's not FIFA, it's not Football Manager. Um, you know, it takes time. Chemistry is a real thing. Connections are a real thing. Kind of, that. you know, you see it now, with, I hate to say it on this channel, but Sung and Kane, you know, they've just got this telepathic connection and that's hard to get. It takes time to get that. Lampard and Drogba kind of had the most goals connecting with that for a good, and it took a while to get that, so... How much do you think, and this is something that I think became relevant and has become relevant re relevant in the opening weeks, is a lack of pre-season, like especially for Chelsea, no pre-season. I mean, as someone who you know has played in the game, you know, coaching in the game, how important is pre-season? Because I feel like it's dismissed by a lot of people because the games aren't competitive. But based on what I've seen as a fan over the years, I think pre-season matters more than people think it does. And I think you're seeing that this year. Would you agree? Another good question, buddy. You've done your homework. Yeah, definitely. Um, Preseason is fundamental. It's huge. And people don't realise that who are not connected in the game. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, it's the weeks where you're getting your fitness. Match fitness and match fitness are two different things and people don't realise that. Um, me and you can go for a jog, two-mile jog, three-mile jog, and we can get through it. <clears throat> Excuse me. But in terms of actually sprinting, stopping, changing direction, sprinting the left, coming back, that is very hard to do. And it's, it's two completely different things, which is why professionals are not rushed back. It takes time to rehabilitate and get yourself back. And in, in pre-season as well, it's where you work on your formations, your, your set pieces, defending set pieces, attacking set pieces, organisation from the back, playing out the back, all these key components of the game that you can't do in, and Lampard keeps saying it, right, real time. And people laugh at real time, but it's true. Um, he's working on it as you're going. So you're spending time working on still these key components and taking time away from preparing for the opponent. Whereas usually, if you already had a pre-season, that would all be done, and you'd just be focusing on the opponent. So it's huge. And I'm never going to jump on that bandwagon of, oh, we're still in pre-season. Yeah, we are still in pre-season, and it's a real thing. And it will take time. You've seen Man United last night. They've won 5-0. They're kind of settling down now. Liverpool and City are starting to kind of settle down now after rocky starts. You've seen the top of the table, Everton, Aston Villas, they haven't had European football. They didn't play to the end of the season. They've had time. They haven't had internationals, many internationals as we have. They've had time to kind of settle down. So hugely fundamental. Preseason is so key. And it's, it's, a stand, it's a standpoint in coaches and players alike, for sure. Mm. As well, I think you talked about the balance of sort of dealing with set pieces and constructing set piece sort of whether that's attacking or you know you're defending and getting that chemistry within the team is so important especially for I think the way Lampard wants to play and with all these new attacking players um, I just wonder with this season how hectic it is and how congested it is I mean Chelsea in the last few weeks and moving on to next week we've got uh, it's, a, it's a long week of travelling this week we've had Man United Krasnodar and Burnley and then I think we're back for Ren at home and then we've got I believe it's Sheffield United at home before the international break. Um, in terms of 
approaching an opponent because I know how much tactical analysis is done at the top level now. I mean, it's so no team. I, I don't know if you were listening, obviously on the English commentary yesterday, uh, Glenn Holder said they Chelsea won't know a lot about Krasnodar and I'm pretty sure that's not the case anymore. I mean, I don't know if you can give any insight. I'm pretty sure most coaches now know about teams, but that balance between tactical sort of insight and analysis of, of opponents, but also working on your own shape, it, it must be a difficult thing for a coach in the modern game to to assess and get right. There's so many components to the game now that maybe weren't components back in the day because of technology, because of what's available to the coaches now. And like you say there, uh, Glenn Hollow, love him to pieces, legend of the game and, and you know, a great person as well. But yeah, Lampard's watch games. He's, he's done his homework on that team, on Krasnodar for sure. He knows more than people maybe assume he knows um, because of the te- technology that's available now. Um, in terms of the tactical stuff, yeah, the tactics are huge. I mean, for the football manager guys out there who play that game, like if you play it, the details in it are ridiculous, especially because the new one's coming out. And I'm a fan of it, by the way, just because I'm, maybe I'm a coach. There's things you can do on that game. That's just a game. So imagine what you can actually do on the training ground and the little decent, the little technicals and the little decencies that you can do to affect a game are huge. And Lampard's one of these coaches who is who wants to be tactically fluent. He wants to be comfortable playing three or four different formations. It's the modern game now. A lot of teams are doing it where they can switch mid-game. Myself as a coach, I do it. Um, I traditionally start in a 4-2-3-1. It's a very safe, easy formation to start with, as we've seen with Glenn Barton. He's been criticised for it. And then you can switch to whatever you need from that, whether it's a 4-3-3, a 3-5-2, a 3-4-3. You can do that. And it's more popular now in today's game. So, yeah, tactics are taken on a whole new level. And also the technology that gives you makes everything available has made the game go on to a whole different level tactically. And that's why um, one person that stands out is Bielsa, tactically incredible. And that's why his Leeds team have done so well so far. I think the, the thing you bring up about formation is relevant to my next question about Chelsea's formation. And there's been so much debate around it this season. So far, unless I get it wrong, I think we've seen three formations from Frank Lampard, as you've suggested sometimes, as we saw against Krasnodar within game when Frank makes a couple changes, he sometimes switches the formation. But generally, we've seen the 4 2 3 1 the most. We've seen a 3 4 3 against Man United. And we've seen a 4 3 3, I believe, twice this season, both in second halves against West Brom and Krasnodar. Um, yeah. it's a very big question and I, you know the answer you just laid out has said that there is fluidity within this you know it's not a, a set thing you don't just go like on FIFA you don't just go 4 2 3 one and that's the way I'm playing the whole time you can change things within game I, I understand that but would you say in your opinion looking at the Chelsea squad that there is a best a best formation that Frank could go with at the current time yeah it's hard um, I mean everybody's in a screen 4 3 3 now right but you have to remember that who that was against, the timing of the game, the Krasnodar were tired, spaces were open. But personally, if I could choose one, I would say 4-3-3. However, that's going to, I said it on Twitter this morning to somebody, that's going to change depending on the opponent. Like if we played a 4-3-3 against United away, we could have got opened up um, because United are frightening on the break. They're lightning, as as people saw yesterday. So it's always going to depend on the opponent um, and the tactics of that particular game. But as a, to answer your question and give you something, in general, I would go 4-3-3 three, three just because of the players we have right now. The only concern would be the holding mid, um, if Conte can be trained to sit in there. If not, we have to sign somebody. People know who I want or even get the guy back off on loan, Ambadou, who I rate as well. They can both coexist. But yeah, so I would say 4-3-3 three, three will be our best formation going forward because of the players we have. We have the two traditional wingers. Uh, or even three or four, if you look at the subs. And then we have the three forwards who, you know, Werner can give us something different to Giroud can. Um, And when I say that the approach will change, the formation may not change, but the approach might. I say that because Werner up top wants balls in behind. He wants to use his pace. So a team that we're maybe dominating could be better for that. Maybe we play Giroud up top. If we're being pressed very effectively from the front and we need to go long, we can have him hold up the ball and the two wingers and the eights can play off him if we're playing in a 4 3 3 so the formation may not change necessarily, but the approach and the tactic will. So that's why I say that Lampard can choose a formation, but maybe the approach will change. But yeah, I'm a 4-3-3 man. I think it's you know a good formation or even a 4-2-3-1, which can turn into a 4-3-3 when you're attacking. So if I had to give you one, I would say that. But I think it will take time to get that 4-3-3 every game and more, we'll see it more because of um, relationships, building the players, um, kind of getting them connections and then that holding mid spot. I think we'll we'll go on to sort of the holding mid spot in terms of 
recruitment in that area and, and what the future of that area holds because it, it does seem to be the next sort of big target area for Chelsea in terms of transfers but in terms of that balance I mean you look at the game against Burnley on Saturday and there's a belief at least for me when you're playing against Burnley all right you know that going up to Turf Moor at least for the first 20 to 30 minutes you're usually up for a game at Burnley it's it's, it's going to be difficult but in games where I think we're going to have a lot more of the ball and you expect Chelsea to control the game, I just wonder against a rigid 4-4-2 whether both Mount and Habits can find space where, say, in a 4-2-3-1 like last night where Cover and Georgie are sitting a little bit deeper and you've only really got Kai in there sort of trying to break the lines. Do you think having Mason in there as well would help in, in, a, in a game of that type? I know we, we spoke about Man United and games where teams are not just going to allow you the ball, but in games like Burnley, where you think we will be allowed a bit more of the ball, that could maybe work. Yeah, so you, against Burnley, if they play like a low block, as many people call it now, or they typically play to frustrate, you're going to need energy and you're going to need the ball move pretty quickly. That's something Mason does very well. Obviously, the energy is obvious, but he also gets the ball and moves it quickly which is a caveat of maybe a Jorginho or Kovacic. They hold on to the ball a little bit too much. Um, Jorginho, Jorginho has a great pass in him, and maybe he could be the key to unlock a Burnley. Um, but with Kovacic, who I actually rate, um, but he can be frustrating at times because he does the whole Pedro thing, right, where he gets them all and does circles and just dribbles for the sake of it. That will be tough against a Burnley team because, one, they'll look to just smash him anyway. And, two, you know, the ball needs to be moved quickly. So in terms of what formation would work against that, I can see Lampard playing any of them. Um, I think the, the three at the back, the wing backs, would be the most less likely. But I can see if he did that. I don't think he will, by the way. But I would say that he could do it because it would give us width. And that because Burnley are such a, a close circle as such, given having width will open up the game. I don't think he'll play it, though. So maybe we could see the 4 3 3. I personally think he's going to go 4 2 3 1. I can see the double pivot happening again. I could just see it because it's safe, it's easy, kind of analyze the game, see where we start. And then we could change. However, I would love it if we just kind of did, went with 4 3 3, go attacking, go at them, try and open up the spaces as quickly as possible. But it's all about trying to get Burnley out of their hole. Um, and we're going to have to do that by switching the ball quickly by getting energy in the box, moving the ball quickly in the final third and getting a goal up as early as possible, ideally. Um, so you need players who can do that, as you say, like the mouths and the habits. I, I think the argument you can make to keep Georgie in this team and to stick to the 4 2 3 one is watch the Crystal Palace game a few weeks back again, you know, against a low block. All right, the first half was a little bit, you know, passive and, and sort of pedestrian, but you expect that against Crystal Palace. But eventually we opened them up. You know, I think Jorginho had a very good game that day and it showed when he's up against that type of opposition, he actually can excel. So, I mean, I wouldn't be gutted if Jorginho's, I mean, Jorginho's probably been one of our better players so far this season by you know, the Jorginho debate the Kante debate these things have been you know worn out and we, we spoke a lot about the, the pros and cons I think Lampard just needs to I don't know about tactical you, you speak about tactical flexibility and sort of formations I think a criticism that has been aimed at Lampard is a lack of clear identity do yeah. you think the shifting in formations is hampering any sort of chance of sort of a um, settling or, or sort of growing a clear identity yeah it is um but there's a reason for it lampard is switching formations because everybody's not 100 percent fit yet um we're getting there now um also because relationships haven't been established yet i think the only real relationship you can really look at uh the obvious one would be maybe Werner and Havertz. So they have a clear understanding because they play together in a national team but apart from that everyone else is still kind of building relationship obviously zuma and silver are coming along nicely now and chill well and Pulisic will hopefully get one in the end, and James and maybe Ziyech. Uh, they're all great off the field. So you can see the love off the field, and that's the relationships building. And people underestimate how important that is. Like, you've got to want to play with your team. You've got to want to be, you know, you've got to have friends in the dressing room. So I think the more that happens, the less we'll maybe see um, the fluency, the fluency maybe of formations. I think Lampard, I think it's clear if you've watched Lampard's teams in the past and kind of listened to what Lampard wants. He wants to play an attacking team, a high-pressing team. Many have said that he's basically copying, copying the Liverpool system, which, by the way, that is coaching, that's football. Everybody finds a system, people copy it, and then the next system comes along. Uh, Conte bought a system, people copied it, nullified it. It worked to start. In the end, it didn't because everybody started doing it. Next cycle, then it's Pep Guardiola's, then it's going to be Bielsa's. That's kind of how football works. So I think the more we see relationships, the more people get fit. And the more consistency in terms of fitness, so we can start the same team every time. 
the less we'll see change of formation, the more we'll see Lampard's true identity of his team, which will be a higher pressing team, win the ball back as high as possible, get the ball up the field as quick as possible and try and score goals whilst remaining defensively solid with that holding mid and the two eights going ahead. I think we, we've seen that sort of chemistry most in the in the past weeks of, you know, defensively having Edward Mendy there has changed so much about Chelsea in defence. Um, having Silver and Rudiger and Dave and Chirwell and, you know, filling in James there as well, in, sometimes in a back three uh, as him as a wing back has, has really helped. And I think that was the issue last season. And sometimes it wasn't down to Lampard just selecting. Sometimes he had a lot of injury problems, so he had to change things. But as you said, hopefully fitness will be, we'll have more luck in terms of fitness because I think that will obviously benefit the relationship and the chemistry and consistency in teams. 